Friends. Hello and welcome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello and welcome to another episode of Making Stuff Look Good. Apparently, we're in the golden age of Metroidvanias. With the release of Hollow Knight on the Switch, Dead Cells, Chasm, and Guacamelee 2, there's no shortage of games delivering on exploring, platforming, and combating all at once. The one I've been spending the most time with so far is Dead Cells. Its combat is just so incredibly fluid. Some platformers can feel a little stiff when it comes to fighting, but Dead Cells nails that, the controls are an extension of my thoughts feeling. The prisoner controls so naturally thanks in part to the incredible character animations. The prisoner's movements are silky smooth and expressive. Every slash, arrow draw, footstep, and ledge grab feels well-timed and intentional. But with the game's massive weapon count, and with each weapon boasting equally smooth, articulated animations, the burden of the game's animators must have been massive, right? Except that they cheated. Those aren't painstakingly hand-animated frames. They're a trick, a facade. It doesn't count as pixel hey, I'm art. I'm gonna go leave a bad theme review. But for those of us that aren't pixel elitists, let's take a closer look at the game's clever pseudo-pixel art pipeline. Now usually I need to do a fair bit of research for these videos, but thanks to a wonderful article on Gamma Sutra featuring Thomas Vasseur, most of the details of the pipeline are already known. We know that the characters in Dead Cells are actually modeled, rigged, and animated in 3D. Animations are then captured into sprite sheets, which are used in the end product. Thomas alludes to a homebrew program that renders the mesh at a small size without anti-aliasing. This program outputs sprites, as well as their normal maps, to do the lighting in some kind of toon shader. The article's a great read that goes on to cover some of the pros and cons of this pipeline. I've linked it in the description and highly recommend you check it out. For our purposes, let's dive a bit deeper into this magical homebrew program mentioned in the article. We'll start by whipping up a quick and dirty skinned mesh with a simple rig and animation. With our turtleneck bro imported to Unity, the next step is to render him into a small render texture. As indicated in the article, it's important that we do this step without anti-aliasing, because we want nice crisp pixels in our sprite, not blurry mushy edges. We'll also use a basic unlit color material. We don't want to capture any lighting information into our diffuse sprites, as we'll be introducing tune lighting later on to the sprites themselves. Our downscaled sprite is going to look really basic and flat right now. I'll also point out that finer details like the glasses don't hold up well when downscaled, so designing characters with larger, more readable features is probably a good call. The real magic of the pipeline comes in this next step. In another texture, we'll render the character using a shader that outputs normals. Here's our normal rendering shader. In the vertex program, we'll transform the normal into view space, and in the fragment program, we'll remap that value into the range 0 to 1. There's an oddity worth mentioning here, you might notice we're using the inverse transpose of the model view matrix rather than the model view matrix itself. This actually only matters if you have non-uniform scaling, which in this case we don't, but it's still more correct to use it as it handles that case properly. I think I've covered the reasoning behind this in the past, but just in case I haven't, there's a really good explanation linked in the description. We'll render this replacement shader onto a background clear to the classic pale blue normal color. Now we have a diffuse sprite and a normal map, so let's cover a shader that combines the two. We've covered normal maps and tune lighting in the past, so there isn't too much new stuff going on here. One thing worth pointing out is the use of the extra input variable with the vFace semantic in our fragment program signature. This value is available in shader model 3 and above, and will be either 1 or negative 1, depending on whether the triangle is a front face or a back face. V-Face comes in handy here because our sprite has backface culling disabled, as we often want to flip sprites when they're moving in the opposite direction. Without accounting for the facing direction of triangles, our normal calculation would be incorrect for the back faces. With V-Face, we can just flip the direction of Z we sample from our normal map before we convert it from tangent space to world space. Remember this trick for regular 3D geometry too, anytime you're disabling the backface culling and want to see correct lighting on the back faces. Aside from that, we'll just perform a little ternary on the dot product of the normal and the light direction. Where the incident lighting is greater than 0.3, we'll use the light color of the main directional light. Anywhere else, we'll use the ambient sky color. This gives us a shading setup of two colors with a hard edge in between them. Perfect for tune pixel shading. So, we've got our normal mapped tune sprite, now we need to animate it. Our 3D animation is based on keyframes and can be sampled at arbitrary frame rates with the in-between values interpolated. That's something we'll have to give up when we go down to 2D sprites. 
We'll instead choose a frame rate, say 30 FPS, and sample our animation at 1 30th of a second intervals. For each animation sample, we'll render our sprites and copy them into an atlas. Then we step time forward by our frame interval and render again, copying into the next position of the atlas. This part of the process could be done in a number of ways, and exactly how you build a tool like this should be based on the requirements and considerations of the artist who will ultimately have to use it. I've put together a scene for capturing animations from Mr. Turtleneck here. A bit of custom editor code lets us assign the character and animation clip, then scrub the animation to preview things. A more comprehensive tool might let us downres the character on the fly so we can preview the final result, maybe even with our tune lighting applied. We can also see from the screenshots of the tool actually built by Motion Twin that there are some options for offset and recoloring of the character. For now, we'll keep things simple. Those of you eager to dig into the c -sharp code behind the editor and the actual procedure of capturing each frame of animation can check out the code available on GitHub. There is one slight Unity-ism going on in the code that I'd like to talk about here though. You'll find that in the Animation Capture Helper, we aren't able to run the capture all at once due to limitations of the Skinned Mesh Renderer component. It turns out that while you can sample an animation from the editor and the bones will update, the skin Renderer itself won't deform the mesh until the next update in the editor. So instead, we return an I enumerator, and after each sample of the animation, we'll yield before rendering the cameras. In the editor half of our component, we'll hook into the internal editor update tick, and as long as our iterator is still yielding, we'll call move next on it each update. If you've ever wondered how Unity's coroutines work under the hood, this is how. There's a lot more I could say about building robust tools for artists. It's something I've been doing a lot of in the past year while on a bit of a hiatus from the channel. If there's interest in this sort of art pipeline and tool stuff, I can cover more stuff like this in the future. For now, let's all appreciate this clever pipeline Motion Twin came up with for Dead Cells. It allowed a single artist to produce and iterate on hundreds of high fidelity sprite animations at an unprecedented cadence. I suspect we'll be seeing a lot of other indie studios adopt this workflow in the near future. Hey, it's been quite a long time since I posted a video, but the outpour of support for the channel has been as strong as ever. Sorry I've been so quiet. I'll see if I can throw together a little channel update or something soon to talk more about where I've been and what I've been working on over the past year. A special shout out as always goes to my supporters on Patreon, you the best. And as always, thank you all for watching, keep on making those video games.